back up and talk about this. All right, look what we got here. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to draw a, a little. Yeah, this right here uh, are the components of an AC system as far as the refrigerant goes. Right? Then you got refrigerant components that are going to be carrying the juice. And then you've also got the electrical components of the system um, that does things that we're going to talk about in a minute. So um, I want everybody to understand how all this stuff goes. And uh, so somebody that knows a little something needs to know knows what this is, right? There's a squirrel cage fan pushing air through it. Hmm? Well. You're not far off the heater core does push, I mean, but that's not the air part of the air conditioning as we're going to look at it today. This right here's the evaporator. Now refrigerant, who knows what the boiling point of refrigerant is? To 21 degrees below zero. Okay, so if it's 21 below zero, you know, uh, you know, have you ever take uh, these uh, cans of, uh, of canned air? You turn the canned air upside down and you get liquid out of it that's just freezing cold, right? Okay, so you can take a coffee cup. Now, don't do this where somebody's going to drink it, you know what I'm saying? But you can spray some of that stuff in a coffee cup and you can fill that coffee cup about half full of that liquid stuff, right? And it'll, because it's in styrofoam, I'm talking about a coffee cup, I mean a styrofoam coffee cup. Because it's styrofoam and it's got such a high R factor, it will actually, that refrigerant will stay, it's actually a refrigerant in the case I'm talking about, it will stay liquid. And you could swish it around in there, and it looks like Sprite or something. Because you don't want to put it in your mouth or on your skin or anything, because you'll get frostbite and all this kind of stuff. But who knows what happens when you pour it on the table? It does the same thing water does when you've got a skillet that's hot, and you pour water in a skillet. What does it do? It boils out of there, turns into a gas, right? Okay, so what, what we're talking about here is a principle called the latent heat of vaporization. And so what that means is, you're turning that liquid into gas, and the temperature of the gas is the same as the temperature of the liquid was when it started to boil. Okay, if I had a <clears throat> boiler here on the stove, and I just put water in it, how hot can I get that water before it stops getting any hotter and starts boiling? You guys know what a boiling point of water is, right? 212, right? Know what you just said? 13. Yeah, 210, 212. That's real, real close, but the long and the short of it is, so <clears throat> once you get a liquid at its boiling point, it's going to start absorbing heat, right, and turn into gas. So what we're doing is we're running this liquid through, there's a little bitty orifice tube here, and I should have one in my hand if I was worth my salt here, but I'll show you one later. But anyway, and it actually lets some, there's liquid that's coming from here through the liquid line, and it actually is going into this evaporator as a low-pressure liquid, and as it goes through the evaporator as a low-pressure liquid, what's it going to do? Take the OR off the word evaporator. It's going to evaporate. As it evaporates, this gets really, really cold. You know how a glass of tea sweats when it's sitting on the table? This is going to sweat. You know how the water drips out of your car when your air conditioner is on? That's the reason. This is sweat, okay? All right, so then you got a big tube it's a lot bigger. It's coming out of here and it's going through this and inside here it's making a, a loop. I get right there. Actually I'm not doing that right. It's actually just going straight in there. But this is actually got a little, give me that one that's cut. That one right there, that silver thing. Turn it around so everybody can see it. See how it's made? See the, the refrigerant's coming in, but there's a little hole at the bottom. See that, uh, that two, where it, where it, all the way to the bottom. Pick that desiccant bag up, that desiccant bag. You know when you got a pill bottle that says do not eat? You ever have one thing that says do not eat? All right, this thing right here, see that little screen? There's a little bitty hole in there. There's a little bitty hole in this thing. And what it does is, there's all the refrigerant mix that's floating about this deep in there. And so it's basically pulling refrigerant in here. See, it's pulling it from uh, in here, and it's going out there to the compressor. And while it's pulling that oil and the refrigerant in there, 
it's kind of like, uh, how many of y'all use a chainsaw? Use a chainsaw? What do you got to do to keep a chainsaw from burning the motor up? You put oil in the gas, right? Same thing. You put oil in the refrigerant, when it's going through the compressor, it lubricates the compressor. That ain't complicated, is it? And this is where it gets its lubrication on the one that's a fixed orifice system. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit later, the fixed orifice system is only one of the kinds of AC systems that we're going to learn about. But anyway, this is the one we're talking about in this thing right here. This goes to the compressor, and then the compressor goes, this is the condenser. Now what happens in the condenser? What does the refrigerator do in the condenser? Take the OR off the end of it. What does it do? It condenses. Everybody's afraid they're going to say something wrong or what? You notice there's a fan here too. So you're going to be pulling air through this, and as you pull air through there, this is going to turn back into a liquid. And now this also this actually has got your desiccant bag in it and all that. And then you got liquid coming back out of here going up here. Now I want you to know the names of all these lines. This is the evaporator. This is the accumulator. That's this thing I just had in my hand. That's the compressor. This is the condenser. And this line right here, this is the suction line. This is the discharge line, which is a little smaller than this line, but not as small as that one. And this right here is the other. Now, I want to show you a different kind of system by just erasing this part of this. All right. There is an expansion valve on some systems right here so that this comes through here and it's got a little alcohol diaphragm on the end of it and <coughs> this orifice here the, the, the liquid line is going through changes sizes based on the temperature of this cold line. Now this is the cold one. Under the hood you know sometimes you'll see one of the lines is sweaty and cold. That's the big line. That's the suction line. That's the low pressure side and all that. Now typically your charge ports will be most of the time in the suction line, I mean, I'm sorry, in the discharge line and they'll be in the suction line or somewhere like that. But you notice, what did we lose when I put that expansion valve in there? What did I erase? The accumulator, very good. Um, you're going to find a littler one in here. It's basically, and it's, well I just drew it around like that, but basically it's Let's just do it this way. And it's a little drier, and I've got one of those over there somewhere too, but I don't know exactly where it is. A little dryer is going to be a lot. Oh, there's one. Give me that little uh, aluminum thing right there. That's it. That's a dryer. See that? See, this is in the liquid line. This dryer, it's got desiccant in it. And it basically is going to get rid of any water that, you know, any moisture that happens to be in the refrigerant. So remember this. And a lot of people, I was talking to a guy that does air conditioning work every day at a dealership one time. I said, have you ever noticed that if you've got an expansion valve, you've got a receiver dryer, and if you've got a fixed orifice, you've got an accumulator? And see, they move the accumulator from the low pressure line to the high pressure line when you got an expansion valve. It's just the way it is. Now, sometimes you'll have a, a system that's got front and rear air on it, and the, uh, in a van, and the rear air, We'll have an expansion valve in the front air. We'll have a, a fixed orifice system. Okay. Personally, I kind of like the fixed orifice system better. Now, uh, there was a, a while back that uh, this lady was driving this Ford Edge, and she said that whenever I drive for about 30 minutes, my air conditioner quits working. And she went to one shop, and they told her she needed a $1,500 evaporator case. Pretty scary, isn't it? I didn't scare the daylights out of you if they go over until that. Well, anyway, so I don't know what they did over there, how they came to that conclusion. <coughs> but she brought it back over so I let it run for about 30 minutes and it quit cooling. And I looked at the pressures on my gauges when I had, I had it hooked, hooked up in the two ports. I looked at the pressures on the gauges and the pressures were both really low. And I said, this thing needs an expansion valve. Is all that's wrong with it. This part right here. And uh, we took a $16 expansion valve, the girl, put it on there. She's freezing cold all the time now, see. You know what I mean? But understanding what those pressures mean is really important. Now, when you first hook your pressure gauges up, you know, your pressure gauges have got different scales on them. Uh, this one right here is a really high pressure scale. It runs up to, you know, really 500 pounds or whatever. This one here typically runs to about 120 and then up a black range. It says retard and it says 400 over there. 
But if you're looking at the numbers, when you first hook your gauges up on one that's you know charged up, you're going to see between 70 and 100 pounds of pressure static without the AC running. That doesn't really mean that you've got enough refrigerant. It just means there's enough refrigerant for it all to work. Now something else that happens, this is an electric clutch on most systems. And you're going to have on the newer systems, you're going to have a, uh, a low side pressure switch. The two wires going to you leak to be. And on the uh, other system, you know, most systems now has got a high side. And it'll actually have reference voltage going through it from the engine controller so it can tell you, tell you what the pressure is. But you've got a high pressure switch and a low pressure switch. Then you've got some relays and stuff so that if the pressure goes too low, some of them have actually got a, a, uh, a little uh, temperature probe in here because we don't want this freezing up. If this freezes up, you don't get any airflow and you don't get any cooling. So we're basically wanting to keep this at about 32 at the least. So if it starts to drop below, this orifice changes states so that it doesn't have as much refrigerant going through there so it doesn't get as cold. Or if it cycles the compressor off and on, like you, some of you might have seen if your compressor, if your air conditioner is not working right, it'll, a compressor will cycle off and on real regularly. And we've got to look at Timothy's on that uh, trailblazer because it's uh, not working like it should. And that'll be fun. But anyway, your two gauges, remember they're supposed to be about the same when you first hook it up. When you start it up, that compressor kicks in. It's going to tell the tale. This is going to usually go up in the ambient temperatures. I've got a lot to do with it. If it's hotter outside, these pressures will be higher. If it's lower, if it's colder, they'll be lower. But you know, on a day like today, you're probably going to see this one pull down to 40 or just below. And on this one here, you're going to see this go up to about 200 to 225 on a day like we got today. If that means everything's okay. But what if the compressor kicks on, but the gauges pretty well stay close to the same pressures? What does that mean? You got any idea? means you got a bad compressor. That's more common than you know, right? If the pressures are both low, you're going to look for a problem here. Or a clogged orifice or something. You got it? So remember that. You're going to run into this other thing. Wherever, and I'm going to tell you something else. If you fix somebody's air conditioner and get it blowing cold again, you're their hero forever. You know what I mean? You're right. You know how it is when you're blistering hot and everything. And somebody does something and all of a sudden your air conditioner is nice and cold. You want to really give them a nice thank you. Anyway, so what, what is this? Somebody sing out. The condenser. Condenser. Pressure. Compressor. Let's get rid of our gauges so they don't confuse us. What's that? What's that? Evaporator. Evaporator. And of course you got a fan here and you got a fan here. These are heat exchangers. You know what a heat exchanger is? Give me another example of a heat exchanger that we're that's not drawn up here. What did you say to start with when I talked about this fan? Heater core. Heater core is a heat exchanger. What else? Radiator. Radiator to heat exchanger. Oil cooler. Anything that takes heat. See, you got three different ways that heat travels. Anybody knows what they are? You got radiation. You got convection. Radiation means you can feel heat of the sun. Or, you know, when you're standing under, a, you're standing here and you can, when you got a heater, you're standing over here and you're holding your hands up, you know, to catch that heat. That's radiation. I'm not talking about nuclear radiation, okay? All right, so <laughs> I'm talking about convection. And convection means when you, when you lay something down on something hot, like on that heater you were looking at on the picture of the transmission test, you know? You lay something on there and you turn that heater on. Because it's laying on that hot plate, whatever's laying on it, heat's going to transfer into it. See, heat's what travels. Cold is just the absence of heat, right? Okay. And so, so you got conduction, which is actually what I was just talking about, not convection. Conduction is whenever something's laying on there and it starts to get hot. Convection is when you take, uh, when you lay something on it and it cools it off. Well, like for example, here's, here's what uh, uh, conduction is. Um, you ever put a french fry in your mouth that was too darn hot? You don't spit it out, do you? You grab that Coke and you pull some coolness in there with it. And that Coke makes contact with that french fry and it cools it off. Right? You got that? And that's basically what I do. So in the radiator of the vehicle, <clears throat> you've got conduction, heat being conducted from the cylinder head and the sides of the cylinder into the coolant. And the coolant now is hot, but that heat is being carried, you know, now the cylinder head and all is cooler. The, the coolant is going into the radiator, 
and it's actually making contact with the radiator, which is making contact with the air. But if you're standing in front of that radiator, you can feel some heat, can't you? You ever seen, you ever felt brakes that was locked up, like on your aunt's uh, truck? Uh, you could stand here and feel the heat coming off those brakes. That was radiation, see? Think about the different ways that heat carries and all that kind of stuff. Um, now, why does, the, uh, why does the ice make your drink cold? Comes in contact with the liquid, starts to melt. See, it's absorbing the heat out of the liquid, and the liquid gets colder. It's basically the way it goes. All right, so now everybody in here could, could do the same thing I just did and draw these systems, right? You can understand that. Okay, you want to do it? So you can do it, but she don't want to. I figured that. This is typically how I teach you. It's what I'll do is I'll let every, I'll just leave the components up there and let you connect them. And I'm going to tell you something. When you're taking your final, part of your final is you're going to have to draw this stuff on a piece of paper while I watch. So you better get it right. You know what I mean? And understanding all that. <clears throat> so, uh, so I've got a little flow chart over here that I created, which is pretty cool. Um, and what you do is, uh, I, this is a funny story. One time I told, uh, there's a guy named Jerry that was in here that was laid off from a cotton mill, 40-something years old. And uh, somebody pulled a Buick Riviera in here that air conditioner don't work on. 85 Buick Riviera. And one of the students brought it in and says, uh, all right, go ahead and let's turn on the air conditioner and let's see if this compressor kicks in. Because the first thing I'm going to do is see if the compressor is engaging, right? If the compressor is engaging, I already know a lot of things, right? If the compressor is not engaging, i got to find out why. Is it low refrigerator? got an electrical problem? got a bad clutch? So I look down in there and I'm looking at the compressor. It won't come on, it won't come on, it won't come on, it won't come on. And uh, he's sitting in the car like this right here. And uh, I says, come on, Jerry, what's going on? He goes, I, I don't guess I know how to turn the air conditioner on on this car. I said, oh, come on, how hard can it be? <coughs> so I sat down in the car and I sat there like he was. <laughs> Same way he was. But what it was, it had a little CRT screen in the middle of the dash. And you'd choose what you want to do. You want know, radio, you want know, air conditioner. This was in 85. You know? And you, you can look that up. You push on that thing, and I mean, you're probably going to see it on a PowerPoint. I actually showed a picture of one like that. Anyway, you had to decide what you were going to do to turn it on. Anyway, the long and short of it was, here's another thing. Make sure you know how to turn the air conditioner on before you start working on it. Because if you ain't got it turned on, you may go off in a totally wrong direction on your diagnosis. That make sense? All right, you got that? So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to see if the compressor's running, right? We're going to do that. If the compressor's running, what are we going to look for then? If the compressor kicks on and runs, I'm going to shut everything down if the compressor will kick on. And I'm going to identify my refrigerant with our handy-dandy refrigerant identifier. And you guys are all going to use that. And I'm going to find out what's in there. And if I hook my refrigerant identifier up, and I see this darn thing has got a mixture of R12 and 134 or some kind of hydrocarbon in it, like propane or something like that, I'm going to unhook my refrigerant identifier, and I'm going to get this other machine that we got in here, and I'm going to pump that crap into a tank that's gray with a yellow top. Remember, trash gas goes in a tank that's gray with a yellow top. All right? When you finish this semester, you're going to get ESCO certification, which means that you will be able to legally work on air conditioning systems in a shop without getting a $32,000 fine. All right? The person that's working on the air conditioner needs to have ESCO certification. Doesn't cost that much, ain't hard to get. I'll tell you more about that later. I've even got a, a, a ESCO certification PowerPoint that I'll throw at you. But the long and the short of it is, let's say I find out I got 100% 134, right? Hook my machine up, look at my static pressures, which really don't tell me a whole heck of a lot. I'm seeing, you know, the you know, like between 70 and 100 pounds usually. There's not any real specs for that than anybody else. You crank it up, and we'll see what those pressures do. One of the things I like to do, let me ask you this. What if the AZ kicked on, and the suction line, the big line coming from the here, got cold, freezing cold, but you still had hot, hot air inside the car? What are your choices then? Do you need to keep looking at the refrigerant system? <coughs> I'd go somewhere else. Inside the car, there's a heater core like he was talking about, and there's a door that blends the cold and the warm air. When you turn that knob that's got the blue and the green, I mean the blue and the red rather, not the blue and the green. If you go to red, if you go to the red side, that blend door is going to let most of the air come through that heater core. Or I mean it's actually going to let air come through the heater core, but it also runs it through the evaporator to dry it out. As you go the other way, then it's going to close off the heater core. Well, if that blend door actuator screwed up and it's always letting it go through the heater, 
you can have, you know, you got, you figured out something then. Now you replaced a blend door actuator on something. What was that? Yeah, she's a contortionist, so I let her go under the dash. Okay, but uh, one way or another, uh, that thing can be bad. Um, you can also have. What if all of this was clogged up with leaves and crud? Or what if the wires were hooked up? This is cool. We got a fan motor one time because we had a burned out fan motor on the car. And we uh, took the fan motor out of the box when we got it from the parts store, put it in there, and we had the fan motor was running, but we wasn't getting no flow. So we pulled the fan motor back out, and we hooked it up on the bench and found out it was running backwards. Because they built it backwards on the inside, so when we put your wires around in the connector and put it back in there, we had good airflow then. See what I mean? Just, just think outside the box on that kind of thing. Cabin air filter, keep it from having good airflow. Is the evaporator freezing up? Had a Dodge truck one time in here that was freezing the evaporator up solid as a brick. And it would quit cooling because that low speed, I mean that uh, which is supposed to cycle a compressor whenever the pressure gets too low, was stuck closed all the time. See what I mean? So. If you understand this stuff, the air conditioning stuff is not really that hard to learn. The most difficult part of the air conditioner stuff is sometimes when you got to pull the whole evaporator case out and replace busted doors in there and heater corners and all that kind of stuff. You know, we do that sometimes too when we have to. So uh, anyway, that's about all I'm going to cover today on that. Um, you know, it's time to go to lunch anyway. Uh, but I'm going to I'm going to YouTube this so you can kind of look at it. And, and uh, there's another girl that's coming in here tomorrow, and she's going to need to see what I just did. And so, uh, anybody got any questions or comments? Or you just want me to shut up so you can go to lunch. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. More, more next time.